otherwise we'll proceed then. Okay, Natalia. Okay, thank you very much. And Jim, thank you very much uh, for being with us uh, today. All yours. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Jorge. Uh, if I can just um, do, uh, share the screen for a moment so that uh, you can see these. Um, these are the two books that uh, Jorge mentioned. And I just wanted to mention that, uh, and, and as Jorge suggested, uh, what I'll be doing today is presenting some part of the uh, uh, Tiny Engines of Abundance book, um, the chapter on Guatemala. Uh, that book details uh, history of peasant productivity and uh, repression of peasants in five different places at five different historic periods. Uh, in England and Wales in the period from 1760 to about 1860, in Jamaica in the period right after emancipation from 1834 to the Morant Bay Rebellion in 1865, Guatemala from um, late 19th and, early and into the 20th centuries, and Nigeria in the late 20th century, in Kerala, in India, after the land um, um, uh, the, the Land Reform Act of 1969. So, part of what I want to do then is talk a little bit about the Guatemala chapter. Um, but I also wanted to mention that the cover of this chapter comes from a wonderful painting from a Zutzer Hill painter from San Pedro, San Pedro La Laguna. Uh, Pedro Rafael, and uh, he's got a, a, a number of other paintings, and I, this one is I, I quite like. So I'll stop sharing now um, so that I can actually see myself and, uh, and, and, and begin. So what I'd like to do today, and, um, and please interrupt me as I'm speaking, and ask questions, or if you feel more comfortable, put a note in the chat and I'll see if I can see it. Um, what I'd like to do today is present a kind of sandwich presentation in which I'll talk a little bit about the inter introduction of the book, which talks about the basic argument around peasant productivity and repression. And the, mo the filler of the sandwich will be the mostly the Malin chapter from the book. And then I'll end with a few con concluding statement chat bits from the book as well. Uh, so if that's okay with everybody, then, uh, then let me start. So um, excuse me if I'll, I'll start by reading a little bit from the introductory chapter of the book, uh, mostly because I don't think I, I could say it as well if I did it off the cuff. Um, and so let me do that as I begin. So the history is outlined in this book, the Tiny Engines of Abundant book, taken to provide over 200 years of descriptions of the marvelous productivity of small-scale peasant agriculture. Almost all of them describe an agriculture that is startling in its diversity, yet in many respects remarkably similar. Around the world, throughout history, those with control over tiny plots of land converted them into gardens. Crops not only used up all the available space on the ground, but grew to different heights with roots that attacked the soil at varying depths. Different plants replenished the soil, fixing or providing an abundance of organic litter. Others provided shade or protected more fragile crops from wind, or had roots that were especially important in binding the soil and preventing erosion. Some plants did better in especially damp soils, others in dry, some in sandy, others in rich. Some produced early, providing nutrition before the fall harvest. Some bore fruit late, extending the harvest and allowing labor demands to be spread out. Getting the mix just right required long experience, hard work, constant care, and careful exp experimentation. Land worked, as one Guatemala reformer proclaimed, with a combination of the hoe and love. 
We have been programmed through 200 years of writing about improvement, progress, agricultural modernization, and development to conflate peasant with poverty. To imagine a peasant ex existence is synonymous with almost idiotic wretchedness, as one description of Irish cutler suggested in the 1830s. Peasant livelihood should not be romanticized. Peasant lives were often full of deprivation and sometimes despair. Relationships in peasant communities could be acrimonious. Conflict abounded over land, between neighbors, between sexes, and across generations. But most often, these descriptions of peasant livelihoods speak of lives of determined self-reliance, of carefully limited needs, of simple comforts, and hard-won independence. What emerges in these descriptions of peasant livelihoods is often not wretchedness, but abundance. The other thing the book outlines is the persistence of attacks on peasants. More than 2,000 years ago, the Testament remarked, the field of the poor may yield much food, but it is swept away through injustice. Scarcely a year has gone by since, it seems, when peasants have not been similarly repressed and attacked most obviously because others, more powerful or ruthless, wanted their land and or their labor. Peasants were incompatible with progress. Their clumsy labors, as the economists described them, could never be as productive as, though, as they would be under the direction of capital. They were threatening in a whole host of ways, too prone to rebel, and to have too many children, too resistant to the embrace of the state or the nation, too immune to the siren song of development, depicted as too slow to adapt and too quick to take offense. Despite careful stewardship of tiny plots of land that nurtured generations, they have been portrayed as serious threats to the environment. Most consistently, it seems, peasants have been seen as incompatible with economic development. If, as Malth has tried to argue, it is unquestionable that wealth produces wants, it is still more important truth that wants produces wealth. The end of quote from Malthus. Then peasants with carefully limited needs calibrated to the returns from the land and adhered to as a means for ensuring self-reliance and independence have for most of these 200 years been anathema to both capitalists and development specialists. So with that as a bit of an introduction, permit me to move on to the discussion of Guatemala um, in, that I have in the chapter. Is, are we okay so far? Good. Uh, so what I'll do mostly is talk about the chapter rather than present it. Uh, and in your questions or comments, which hopefully you have some, uh, I'll be glad to answer questions about Guatemala uh, or try to answer questions about Guatemala or about any of the other places or arguments that I make here. So, so the Guatemala chapter starts with an account from the Rene report, which is the recuperation of historical memory report of the Catholic Church, um, the Catholic Truth Commission, which was presented by the Catholic Church in the 1990s. In their account, Achimayan villagers from the Plan de Sanchez and Baja Verapaz recalled, and I quote, the military destroyed our houses, stole our goods, burned our clothes, took away our animals, flattened our milpa. They hunted us day and night. This was, of course, part of the shocking violence against Mayan villagers and others in the 1980s that the UN version of the Truth Commission labeled genocidal. 
Lots has been written about it. Uh, but one of the things that is not commented on very often is how many of these attacks focused on the basis of peasant livelihood. They flattened our milk, burned our fields, stole our animals, destroyed our seeds, and prevented us from working in our fields emerges as the central motif from ev virtually every page of this and a subsequent UN Commission Clarification of History report. So this chapter in this book argues that rather than being restricted to a particularly grotesque moment in Guatemalan history, violence against mostly Mayan peasants permeates the history of Guatemala a violence that sees racism intertwined with arguments about peasant inefficiency and obstinate traditionalism. It also highlights how that discourse, discourse was not just reiterated by Guatemala owners and politicians and intellectuals, but was reinforced by the observations of foreign travelers, development specialists, anthropologists, and disgracefully, historians. The chapter traces these attacks, and, but juxtaposes them with descriptions from almost the same moments of time of peasant efficiency and productivity. So the chapter has these two sides to it. It talks about the attacks, and then it says, well, but look what so-and-so is saying. It talks about the attacks and then it says, but look at so-and-so was -so. saying. So it tries to add this in this chapter, as in all of the other chapters of the book, it tries to balance uh, to, um, to offset these attacks by looking at the other, the arguments that argue for something very different. It starts at what one might consider to be the beginning which is classic Mayan agriculture and the way it has been portrayed in the academic literature. And I'll run through this quickly, but I find this, this part of it actually quite interesting. I don't know if others do, I'm more interested in contemporary stuff. But early exploration of ancient Mayan cities, as you all probably know from John Lloyd Stevens' adventures in the mid 19th century, to the writings of the Carnegie group of Sylvanus Morley and Eric Thompson in the mid 20th century, were astounded by these in the midst of the rainforest. Finding them in areas with limited population, they presumed that the Swidden Milpa farming that prevailed when they uncovered these cities held true throughout their history and then posited arguments about mostly empty ceremonial centers. Because significant populations could not possibly be supported in such environments with such agricultural techniques. This view held sway for many decades. By the late 1960s and increasingly into the 1970s, uh, what we call dirt archaeologists, uh, and those now able to read better Mayan hieroglyphs knew that instead these sites and many more held remarkably large populations. Infrared mapping of house sites and deep core samples of household fire pits have led to more or less accepted arguments that Tikal might have had 90,000 people. El Caracol, 150,000 people. And the whole southern lowland region of classic Maya had a population of 10 to 13 million people. From the perspective of 2022, this might not seem so remarkable, but if we look back just a little ways, in the 1940s, people were arguing that the population of all of the Americas in 1492 was 10 million. Uh, and that suggests the um, how remarkable 
this transformation of our, our, our idea of 1492 is. So the obvious question becomes, following from Morley and Thompson, how was this population fed? We have only just begun to explore the remarkable range of the highly sophisticated and wonderfully productive agriculture that was used by classic Maya, from raised bed wetland agriculture to sustainable agrarian urbanism. Though diverse, the key to this apparently remarkably productive agriculture was lots of labor on small plots of land intensively farmed through polycropping with milpa as the base. It's worth mentioning, I think, that remarkably similar, that similarly remarkable discoveries about agriculture have happened all over the Americas. Um, or before, talking about agriculture before too. Despite all sorts of evidence of it, there are continues to be historians and archaeologists and scientists who continue not to accept all of the evidence of large population levels and intensive agriculture production before 1492. This continued unwillingness to accept arguments about the sophistication of Mayan agriculture has prevailed throughout Guatemalan history. And part of the reason for this denial, I argue, was that by the time the Spanish were commenting on Mayan agriculture, they were met with some of the same conditions that confronted Morley and Thompson. The remarkable collapse of Mayan population levels due primarily to epidemic diseases, even be, that began even before Pedro de Alvarado and the Spanish arrived in the Guatemalan highlands in 1520, was not only a holocaust that devastated polities and cultures and communities and families, but made complex labor-intensive agriculture impossible. And the Spanish, of course, did a pretty good job of hollowing out that shell even further. So like Morley and description of, of an unproductive classic Maya agriculture, the perception of an impoverished highland agriculture lingered throughout Guatemalan history. One period I examine in detail in the book is the 19th century with the spread of coffee cultivation and the liberal revolution uh, that accompanied it. And I'm presuming we have a, some basic understanding of Guatemalan history here. And if we don't, then you know, stop me and we can discuss it. There's a period up until 1865, the Rafael Carrera period, until Carrera dies. That was a, during that period, there was an acknowledgement that forced labor from highland communities threatened their productivity. It was recognized that not only did these communities provide the nation with food, that they were responding well and appropriately to opportunities to diversify into cochineal and and other market crops. There was also a general recognition asserted time and again by Jefe's politicals and highland communities that Maya peasants worked continually and hard. Jefe's politicals often opposed their conscription into the army, for instance, because as they, as one said, he did not want them to lose their habit of industriousness. Of course, for a variety of reasons that I outlined, by the later 19th century, with the predominance of a particularly rapacious type of agrarian capitalism based on large scale coffee production, these concerns were abandoned, and the focus was on extracting as much labor as possible from these communities. In this period, I detail most especially the ways liberal labor demands helped impoverish Mayan peasant agriculture. And then how such impoverishment was used as justification for further measures against Mayan peasant 
communities. How a manufactured poverty became further justification for racism and attacks on peasant livelihoods. So this attack is well documented, but what is less well understood about this period is how various types of forced labor recruitment impoverished peasants precisely because it made labor intensive polycropped peasant agriculture less possible. Robert Carmack, for example, is estimated by that by the end of the 19th century, forced labor of various kinds from one highland municipality amounted to 336,000 man days a year. As one German planter said, not the soil, but rather the low wages of our laborers are the wealth of the Koban. This was accompanied by a rhetoric, again reflecting tropes used in England and Jamaica and elsewhere about the laziness and inefficiency of Mayan peasants. One of the most prevalent arguments echoed a concern most decided, raised most decidedly a half century earlier by the Reverend Thomas Robert Malthus. I don't need to mention Malthus's well-known arguments about the danger of population increase if the poor were not made to full, feel the full weight of their wretchedness. But Malthus was not just a one-trick pony. And he was more obsessed later in his life with arguments about the role of increased needs or wants in promoting economic growth. He had come to that one could, could prevent sloth without recourse to wretchedness if people would just raise the level of their needs. This argument became a kind of mantra among political economists so it's one of the ways, it and it was one of the ways it was supposed that civilized people, read English people, were different from others, were that they had more needs, and thus worked harder to meet them, and thus produced more wealth. Others could not be expected to foster generalized prosperity because they were satisfied with limited needs. This argument became a central focus of English policy towards Jamaican ex-slaves uh, turned peasants in the 1850s, epitomized by Thomas Carlyle's occasional discourse on the Negro question. Here he argued that some new form of slavery needed to be imposed on the islands to prevent ex-slaves from living off the land sitting yonder with their beautiful muzzles up to their ears and pumpkins while the sugar rots around them because labor cannot be hired, he said. The same discourse finds voice in Guatemala. And Maya were tarred with the same brush, warning about the detrimental impact on national well-being caused by their limited needs. From at least the writings of people like Antonio Fuentes y Guzman in the 17th century, who after describing the wonderful array of crops produced by indigenous peasants in the Oriente of Guatemala, bemoaned that there was no not greater production because of, and I quote, the limited acquisis acquisitiveness of the Indios. Or as the official newspaper expressed it in the late 19th century, the Indian is a pariah, stretched out in his hammock and drunk on chichi, his natural beverage. His house is a pigsty. A ragged wife and six or more naked children li live beneath a ceiling, grimy with the smoke of a fire that burns day and night in the middle of the floor. Some images of saints with the faces of demons, four chickens and a rooster, and two or three skinny dogs. Yet in that state, the Indian is happy. Or as a newspaper in the Koban declared in 1887, 
Without needs to exalt their way of being, the Indian only obeys the customs of the ancestors and remains stationary. Or as one German immigrant to the country complained, an enormous disadvantage for this country is that the Indians won't work more than enough to fill their basic needs, and those are very few. I can go on, I won't. These same tropes are repeated time and again through the decades and well into the 20th century. So Chester Lloyd Jones, writing in the 1940s in what became the standard English language history of Guatemala until the 1980s. And though there is no indication in his work or in his notes that he spent any significant time in the countryside, he criticized Indian cultivators, and those words, unwillingness to produce for the market or to in other ways contribute to the national economy. And I quote, retarded by the traditional habits of life. He argued, for example, that Mayan cultivators engaged in no seed selection. This attitude persists through the revolutionary decade from 1944 to 1954. The Director General of Agriculture for much of the administration of the revolution, Hector Sierra, was especially disparaging about Mayan agriculture. Though he recognized the hard work of peasants, he argued, and I quote, the Guatemalan Indian does not even bother about where or how he plants his corn his chief object being to have corn planted that he can take care of as tenderly as a father cares for his children. And later, though he would hate the com comparison, he provides a description that's not very different from that cited by the newspaper in the 19th century earlier. Sierra said, the Indian is happy when he grows corn, even though what he calls happiness to us his misery. I go on, even during the agrarian reform from 1952 to 1954, there was lots of disparaging comments and arguments about peasant and peasant agriculture. Um, and of course, after the coup, after the overthrow of Arbenz in 1954, government officials and many observers forced peasant beneficiaries off the land, arguing specifically that they were wasting good land. The chapter doesn't try to suggest that the violence aimed at Mayan communities in the 70s and 80s was only a function of the lingering effects of arguments about the incompatibility of Mayan peasant agriculture with agricultural efficiency or economic growth. But in the late 1970s, before the violence thrust its own demented logic on the country, state-led repression was directed most clearly at measures and movements that were strengthening peasant agriculture. One Oxfam study in 1982, for instance, found that between 1976 and 1978, in the department of El Quiche alone, 168 leaders of cooperatives and village organizations were killed in what the authors labeled the suppression of a rural development movement. And as I suggest, a careful reading of the testimony of the two truth commissions suggests that a large part of the horrible violence of the 1980s was directed at peasant agriculture. Thousands and thousands of peasants would report they flattened our milking, burned our fields, stole our animals, destroyed our seeds, and prevented us from working in our fields. So if you guys still have some energy and some attention, uh, I will move to the second stream of the, the work on, on Guatemala, which is where I attempt to counter all of this evidence with it, all of this with evidence of peasant productivity and abundance. Are we okay with that? Good, I see one, two thumbs up, so that's good. Um, 
So, for example, the chapter provides all sorts of reports about Mayan community peasants in the 19th century before being swept up in the liberal re revolt and reform, responding well to new opportunities provided to them, both farming new land in the Boca Costa as population levels began to recover and pro producing a diverse range of crops for the internal and the export market. Indeed, one of the most distinctive characteristics discussed by observers by the middle of the 19th century before coffee or before coffee the liberal revolution swept was how efficient mayan communities were in providing specialized crops for the internal market and how effectively they were responding to the export market in first cochinel and then coffee Early in the expansion of coffee production, Mayan peasant producers demonstrated that they were the most efficient such producers. Being able to combine milk production and with coffee production to maximize both labor and land use in doing so. Part of the reason for the excessive violence directed against Mayan peasant producers at the 19th century at the behest of coffee planters was not because Mayan peasants were not responding to the market in producing coffee. As many argued then, and some historians have argued since, but precisely because Mayan peasants were doing so and large landowners could not compete with peasant producers without artificially reduced labor costs. Despite these afflictions, peasant productivity continued. A few years before Chester Lloyd Jones wrote so disparagingly about Mayan Milpa farmers, we have the work of some more thoughtful anthropologists who, unlike Jones, actually spent some time in the countryside. One of the first and most interesting of these was Ruth Bunzel, who did field work in and around Chichi Castanango and Solola in Highland Guatemala in the 1930s. According to Bunzel, Maya peasants felt Ladinos, who did not cultivate land, lived, a, in her words, sordid, insecure, and vicious life, hounded by debts brought on partly because expanded needs, increased expenditures. She provided a searing and evocative description of the depredations and impoverishments of debt bondage. She says that if the worker is fortunate enough to escape malaria and dysentery, he is sent back to his mountains in debt. And she described how during the coffee harvest, Every few days, the bell in Chichi Castanango is toiled, told to commemorate the passing of some citizen who has died in the finca. The bodies are not brought back, but word of the death is sent to relatives who pay to have the bell rung. Despite these afflictions, Bansal described agriculture life of the Cachigal Maya around Chichi Castanango as one of abundance an abundance produced by hard and productive agriculture. The towns near the homes near the town had carefully tended and irrigated gardens where luscious vegetables are grown year round. Homes higher in the surrounding hills were substantial homesteads of adobe and tile. The whole country, according to her, wears an amplitude of prosperity. Wears, wears an air of amplitude and posterity. The peasant economy revolved around complex polycrop mill production, using hundreds of different varieties of corn for particular fields, in particular circumstances, growing with different kinds of beans, either freehold the mice, to milpa, sorry or freehold circa, depending on circumstances. Different types of squash, mesquil or chilecayotes, and an almost endless list of other vegetables grown on the land. 
Bunsell described how one small farm of 22 cuerdas, about less than three acres, produced almost all the family needed in a marketable surplus. This exceptional productivity was the result not just of carefully constructed agriculture, but a function of hard work. In sharp contrast to the description that provided above by the news, Bunzel says, the Indian takes no siesta. From the moment of his early rising before dawn has whitened the sky until he extinguishes his Akode torch late at night, his day is filled with orderly and unceasing activity. Except at fiestas, I have never seen an idle Indian, male or female. So, Bunzel was probably particularly astute in her description of my agriculture productivity, but it's echoed by a whole bunch of other anthropologists working around the same time and slightly later. Uh, I describe how during the revolutionary period, despite the words of Hector Sierra, those people working on the agrarian reform in peasant regions talked about how peasant, peasants responded remarkably well and remarkably quickly to opportunities provided to them by the agrarian reform. And uh, we have tons and tons of descriptions, some of them by the people um, uh, in the agrarian affairs department created after the overthrow, who were meant to be taking the land away from peasants, who were shocked at just how wonderfully productive peasant agriculture had been in the two years that they were able to construct peasant uh, livelihoods uh, before the overthrow of our in 1954. Um, uh, and our figures for the the production of the country indicate this. In the period that in the 1952 to 54 harvest, we not only have more corn production than at any other time in Guatemalan history, we also have the highest coffee production during that period, almost all from increasingly small producers producing coffee. Uh, it's getting long here, so let me come to an end uh, here. Following the overthrow, cotton, sugar, palm oil now, displaced peasants, fostering the need for thousands and thousands more laborers for the harvest, hunger and nutrition followed. A goat of hunger provided the labor force, creating, uh, in the midst of all of this, Government officials and many foreign advisors continue to disparage milk agriculture and counsel attacks on peasant livelihoods. Yet if we hunt hard enough, we find all sorts of evidence for their productivity. A USAID study in 1973, for example, argued that highland peasants got times the yield per acre that large farms did and increased their production more uh, with every dollar of capital spent than, than other kinds. Or a remarkable book by the geographer Gene Wilkins, a careful study of peasant farmers in Guatemala and Mexico, uh, done a decade later in the 1980s. He argues that in most locations in Guatemala, peasants farm very small plots of land, often less than an acre. He described immensely complex agriculture, different products intercropped in different locations for different effects. Wilkins provided a description, for example, of vertical space in dooryard garden plots of no more than one tenth of a hectare that may contain two dozen or more plants, each carefully calibrated to take up distinct spaces from tall trees to medium height trees to bushes to vegetables, all intertwined with careful, with useful vines. No wonder such small scale peasant agriculture using intensive agri uh, labor produced seeming miraculous returns. <laughs>
Wilkins summarized this by suggesting any lingering images of the lazy, dull, non-economic peasant farmer must surely have vanished. You've been very patient. Let me conclude this by stepping back briefly from the wider picture and providing some sort of conclusion to this. Wilkins' description is remarkably like those provided of all of those other places I outlined in the book, um, in, in um, Tiny Engines of Abundance. So for instance, this description of a cottage garden in England in the 18th century, provided by Sir Thomas Bernard, he, he described describes land rented by a guy named Britton Abbott near Tadcaster, England in 1798. It consisted of a cottage and a rood of land, which is a quarter of an acre or a tenth of a hectare. And I quote, enclosed by a hedge containing the cottage, 15 apple trees, one green gauge, three wine sour plum trees, two apricot trees, several gooseberry and currant bushes, abundance of common vegetables and three hives of bees. Abbott and his wife of 45 years got 40 bushels of potatoes from a quarter acre of land, had raised seven children, and lived very happily together on the land, according to Bernard. I could go on and on and on of these kinds of descriptions. Uh, I won't. They're in the book. Um, but let me just try to provide one description at the other end of the book of the hut dweller garden in, 1990, in, in Kerala from 1995. The spaces, and this is a quote, the spaces between the coconut plants are used to, to raise an array of intercrops, resulting in a multi-storied cropping pattern with distinct canopy stratification. Thus, perennial crops are such as coconut, Aki nut, jack, mango, cashew, tamarind, and forest trees species occupy the upper layer. Pepper, clove, nutmeg, cinnamon, and so on occupy the second layer. Banana, cassava, yam, and the like occupy the third layer. Ginger, turmeric, pineapple, vegetables, and guinea grass occupy the ground layer. The result in canopy arch architecture approaches that of a tropical rainforest in its structure and density. Finally, sorry, it's gone on longer than I thought. Finally, if I can return to England very briefly, a fellow named Arthur Young and Thomas Robert Mothos engaged in a very public debate at the end of the 19th, at the beginning of the 19th century. Young, they both said they were addressing the poverty that had fallen all over England, that afflicted the majority of the population of England. Young argued that the best way to address that poverty was to provide cottagers with land. And he said, peasants would turn rocks into fertility because it's the wrong. Malthus, on the other hand, argued he blamed the poor for their own poverty, counseled the end of poor relief, and constantly fretted that providing them with land would lead to population increase. Young argued he would address poverty by giving peasants what he wanted, what they most wanted. Malthus argued he would address poverty by denying peasants what they most most wanted and have them labor for capitalists for the benefit of all. Seems to me that basic argument has continued for 200 years and for time we stood solidly on the side of Young in this argument. Sorry, I went on longer than I expected. Thank you for your, atten your attention. And I'm glad to try to address any questions you might have. Okay. Thank you very much, Jim. That was a 
thoughtful, we have plenty of things to talk, certainly. Uh, what we're going to do now then, uh, Natalia is going to uh, basically uh, uh, organize a discussion. So if people want to, to, to ask questions, uh, uh, just please uh, raise your hand. Uh, Natalia uh, would be also uh, taking a look at the chat if anyone wants to talk, uh, like why will there now? So uh, Natalia, keep, keep, uh, keep a record and, and you direct the questions and we'll go on. So Wilder, why don't you go ahead and then we'll begin. Yeah, thank you. I believe uh, Patricia was first, though. I don't know if she had a question or not, but... No, no, I just clapped my hands. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, I thought it was. Uh, Jim, I really appreciate very much your presentation. This is this. But actually, what you didn't mention in your presentation, during this period in which it's actually a small agricultural producer, which is characteristic in Central American economy, and I would say it actually in parts of Peru, Bolivia as well, they play a very critical role in providing actually most of the food which is consumed by the urban population. Um, but we, you, did, you didn't mention very much, I don't know if that is intentionally or not, what sort of support from the states they receive? This, there was an active, for example, agriculture uh, development uh, initiatives taking by the uh, government. I think actually in the 50s when the revolution started, the government was really very interesting in supporting and digging. In, in fact, that actually there was collaboration from the government with the, um, the University of Costa Rica, which at the time had uh, one of the best uh, centers for cooperative studies. And uh, I, I have noticed actually the uh, there was put a lot of the, uh, uh, work and uh, guidance for uh, organizing cooperative business in Guatemala at the time. So I'm just wondering, uh, you know, when you describe it, you describe it like uh, the uh, are sort of the own initiatives, you see, and uh, there's nothing that the government uh, perhaps did. I don't know, you know, it's, that's, that's not my question. But it's, it's critically important because actually, uh, what we're seeing today is the total abandonment, and not only in, uh, in Central America, but also in parts of South America, of the small uh, producers. And this is the case in Peru as well. Peru is right now with a new president is trying to pass a new uh, reform agraria too, which is actually, I have my questions is going to be because there's not much consultation there. You know, one of the bad habits we have in Latin America uh, is to pass law and after we discuss, you know, and uh, without consulting anybody. So if you could perhaps just elaborate a little bit um, what sort of support they did or they didn't have from the states. Uh, well, thanks, Wilbur. Uh, Wilbur now, um, those are all really interesting and um, um, complex questions to address. Uh, and certainly one of the things that happens in trying to do a book that talks about these five different cases. Uh, is that um, there, you address each of them with kind of broad strokes. And uh, so, um, uh, but elsewhere, certainly I've talked um, more about um, um, uh, government initiatives and government uh, relationships with peasant agricultures. And there certainly have been a few times in Guatemalan history when the central government has apparently been more interested in uh, assisting small scale agricultural producers, uh, either because they just want to relieve poverty or because they understand that they're going to afford uh, the majority of, of, of uh, food for the country. Um, during the during the Guatemalan Revolution, particularly, I have a PhD student who just finished a, a while ago who did a very, very good work on the, uh, uh, on the um, agricultural department in Guatemala through the whole revolutionary period. Um, and uh, one of the things that happens is that the Guatemalan government, uh, even through the 40s and 50s, and even into the Arbenz period and the, and the agrarian reform period um, is particularly interested, is interested in increasing small scale agricultural production, 
but is particularly interested as well in changing what peasants do. Uh, and so they're not particularly, they're, they don't look at uh, polycropped milk production, for instance, and see in polycropped milk production this um, wonderful opportunity to produce more, to use the factors of production more efficiently. What they argue for is they want to move peasants from the highlands to the Pacific area and have them grow uh, new varieties of hybrid corn in an industrial, in very small kind of industrial fashion, so that they're single cropped corn on, on you know, in, in that kind of land. Um, and so most often when you find in the, in the Guatemalan context, certainly, when you find the government being engaged in support for small-scale agricultural production, they do exactly what you say will do. They don't listen to peasants about what works and what doesn't work. So they go into the highlands and they tell peasants, grow broccoli, not for internal production, but for somewhere else. And the peasants grow broccoli, they get better re uh, re uh, returns for two or three years. And then the land no longer produces broccoli without huge amounts of fertilizer and, and, pet and that kind of stuff. Um, so uh, not wanting to extend this too long, I think you're perfectly right. There are all sorts of really complex relationships that are going on between governments and peasant producers and governments and small scale agricultural production that I didn't get into. But if I can, again, revert to a broad stroke, the broad stroke is they tend not to listen to peasants when they do so. And so um, part of what happens is even in places like Kerala, which I talk about later in the book, where the government is truly interested in relieving poverty, the government produces poverty by um, um, or exacerbates poverty by uh, interfering in peasant production in ways that um, prevent these, this kind of efficient polycropping. People from the outside, I'm convinced, I, I didn't think this when I started this work, but I'm convinced that people from the outside who don't understand polycropping just see a mess when they see polycropped fields. And, 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 um, and, and, and if, but if you listen to peasants talk about polycropped fields, then it's not a mess at all. It's a wonder. So, sorry, could go on. So it's a very interesting question, and, and there's all sorts of ways that that needs to be or could be um, made more sophisticated and complex that discussion. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, we have on the list Jorge and then Patricia. I don't know if, well, you will decide if you want to respond after the, or do you want to respond right away after Jorge's? I'll see how interesting Jorge's question is. So <laughs> okay, what a pressure. Okay, let's see. Uh, a couple of comments first. Uh, first of all, I think that what comes really clear through your presentation uh, of the chapter, uh, two things here. First is the centrality of land, uh, right? Uh, for Guatemala, Central America, and many other parts of Latin America, land is at the center of political, social, economic disputes uh, dating back, you know, to the to the, the Spanish conquest uh, up to now. We can make the case, right? And uh, how that is. Uh, uh, mix, you know, with racism uh, coming from all these comments, you know, dating back again. Uh, and I found really interesting the figures with which you opened, you know, the archaeological findings about the productivity uh, of the of the of this peasant uh, indigenous lands, and eventually how again and again they are described by these cultural traits as lazy, unproductive, and so on. Again. Uh, despite the evidence. So the balance between, on the one hand, these descriptions, this violence, and then on the other hand, the reality of other observations about the, the productivity, I think it, it really works uh, really nice. Uh, and it's at the, I think, at the center of the explanations of the violence uh, that has played Guatemala. Uh, I have 
I have a couple of questions. And uh, what is about given all these racist images and tropes that have been used? And they struck me the, 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 the term peasant, right? Because it's a peasant indigenous, you know, right? The, the, this is a loaded term in the 1940s and 50s, uh, especially the people I'm looking at uh, in, in Mexico, right? I'm starting a part of this indigenista movement, they recategorize uh, indigenous peoples as peasants, right? Uh, and all that. And that had huge implications in terms of assimilation and so on. So when you're talking about peasants, you know, and observation of peasants, are we talking about people who are looking at the small peasant, Ladino farmer? Are we talking more about indigenous communities in, in highland areas? Uh, are, is there any uh, difference uh, in, in the way how they're described, in the way how they interact you know, with the market, all that? So that, that's, a, that's one thing that came to my mind as well, uh, as was listening. And the area is the, the comparative, uh, the comparative side, side of, of the book, which I really, I know I want to read the book, of course, uh, to add more to my list, right? But uh, really I have 10 copies, Jorge. Okay, <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> the, the point is, uh, when, you, when you started thinking about the project, how did you come about these different examples uh, or the different, uh, the different Guatemala, obviously, because this is a place where you have studied uh, over the years, right? But how did you decide on the other, what, what caught your attention on the other cases that, that you treat in the book? So those would be my two questions. Okay, uh, so Patty, if it's okay with you, I'll try to answer Jorge's or respond to Jorge's questions first. Um, Absolutely. Okay, so uh, let me start with the last one first, Jorge, because I think that might lead me into the other ones. Um, I didn't start out thinking I was going to do this book. I, I, I'm a Guatemalanist. I continue to call myself a Guatemalanist, right? So, um, but I wanted to under, I've always wanted to understand why in Guatemala there was this prejudice against small scale peasant agriculture, whether it was Lino or Ladino or Maya. And uh, in my own kind of perverted way, I decided that I, to understand that I had to go back to. England and the beginning of political economy. And so that prompted me to do the first book on this list, which was the Apostles of Inequality, and to go back and try to understand the, 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 the impulse uh, in that period of English agricultural, what's called the agricultural revolution often, 1760, 1860, in which supposedly, English England provides the model for the rest of the world where you can have this rapidly increasing population and they can continue to increase their agricultural production and the people can go off and work in industry and everybody's happy and rich, right? And so um, clearly that's not what happened. Um, and so I did that work. Doing that work prompted me, quite surprisingly, because I didn't expect to find this when I was doing this, that work, was to find all of this discussion about how wonderfully productive cottage agriculture was in England um, in, the, in this period. As part of that work, I was also looking at the way political economists wrote about labor and was also interested then in part of the work on Jamaica. And so I started to do work in the um, Royal Commissions on Jamaica. And there's a whole series of Royal Commissions on Jamaica around peasantry and uh, the apprentice period and a whole bunch of other things. And that surprising to me, brought me up full scale with exactly the same issues that were apparent in England. Peasants, um, ex-slaves who, who emerged from slavery um, in 1834, and then there's an apprentice period, uh, rapidly became these incredibly efficient producers on land they got in various ways. Attacked in a whole bunch of ways that were very similar to what happened in England. And so all of that prompted me to think, well, there's a pattern here. And I got three chapters. I got England, Jamaica, and I 
and do Guatemala, let's look at other places. And I had read Robert Nedding's PhD dissertation on the Kofia and the Joss Plateau in Nigeria before, and that seemed to be a good place to start for that. So, and, and Corella is interesting in its own right for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, so that's why I got to all of those. The thing that, to go back to your first question, one of the things that I try to do, though I think land is super, super important, one of the things I try to do is decenter land from this discussion and center more clearly labor. Because one of the issues that seems to me that comes up is not that people needed that cats and coffee producers and all of these other people needed land. What they needed was labor. And the expropriation of labor from this incredibly labor intensive polycrop agriculture was, if anything, more detrimental than the exploitation of expropriation of land. Um, and so, um, um, and of course, that also fits with the need of capitalists to have wage laborers. Um, uh, however, however free they might be. Um, and so, um, and so I think that there, um, so, so land is interesting. To me, labor was, became increasing. As you know, I did most of my work on land before. Uh, labor became increasingly interesting. One of the other things that happened as I was going through this was, I'm used to seeing the world from Guatemalan perspective, and I'm used to seeing the world, uh, a world divided between Maya and non-Maya, between Maya and Ladino. Uh, when I got to England, I was seeing exactly the same language being applied to peasants, to cottagers in England that were applied to Mayan peasants in Highland Guatemala, uh, if you just took out the word Maya or Indio or whatever. And so that also struck me as being, uh, this is an interesting, so how, to what extent is race being used simply as a means to justify policies that would be in place were race not there? Now that's too simple. I'm not saying that exactly happens, but I'm, I'm saying there's a tendency to do that. Um, um, in, in all of these places. So, you, but of course, race a lot, distinguishing by race allows you more easily to, um, to extend your um, depredatory kinds of policies um, to, to whole populations. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think we can move on with uh, Patricia. Uh, thank you for all that. I, th I think the previous questions have actually touched on a lot, so I'll just say a few things. <laughs> uh, sorry, Jim, if this uh, repeats uh, some of it. But what's really striking about what, and even just the last sentence you said, Jim, last little bit about detaching people from the land and the way uh, and the significance of their labor um, even though I'm still working in Guatemala and Central America, I've also been part of a project um, helping uh, people at, up at Island Lake uh, in uh, Garden Hill um, recover their stories. And I am currently working through the Hudson Bay Company records. And the, the Hudson Bay Company factors are replicating exactly what you're discussing. The way they talk about um, the, the rhetoric they use to describe those people they encounter, who they can't possibly know anything about, but project an incredible amount of, uh, of assumptions onto them, at the very same time that without these same people guiding them, <laughs> showing them how to survive in this incredibly harsh climate, they would die without, right? So they both need them 
and then justify their own colonial actions <laughs> against them by somehow deeming them to be inferior and less than and less productive and you know clearly don't you know they're just not as good as we are and somehow they need us to come here and help them <laughs> right yeah. it, it was really striking i was just simply reading through some of that this morning and i'm like listening to you i'm like Again, we could take out the word Maya <laughs> and we could take it, put it into a different context. These aren't peasant farmers. They aren't making milpa, but they're, they're fishing, they're hunting, they're fur trading, right? It's, it's profound. So I, I thought that was really stunning uh, to see that kind of similarity and the echoes that move through that. Uh, the second piece I think you may have, the second question I sort of had was, um, you may have talked about a bit more going back to the Audubon's years. And um, uh, I am struck, and I wanted to, I think you may have talked about this a bit, but I'd love to hear a little bit more, um, because everything I've read about that time period, and I haven't looked at it from the peasant's perspective and the Ministry of Agriculture, but I'm looking at it through a gendered lens and reading how everyone talked about this need for land and what it meant. Um, there does presume to be in all of these efforts, the idea that things will be better if, these, if people have access to their own land. I know in the case of the work I've been reading with uh, the Alianza Femenina Guatemalteca and their argument that women should be given land as well as men, head of households. Um, and the assumption is they're desperate and poor and need to be able to work their land, which then assumes all the things you've talked about. They're productive, this will feed their families, this will improve their lives, <laughs> this will bring about something better for Guatemala, right? Could you say anything more about that? Because it seems like that was a very powerful, um, you know, emphasis. I mean, it cost them their president to, to do this, right? I mean, this, right. this brought down the entire project completely. Yeah. Yeah, well, and, that, and that's, uh, uh, that's very useful questions, Patty. I think, um, so, one of the let me go let me go back and do two different things, two different streams here. The first is that um, you know I'm not the first by any means to argue that capitalists and political economists have had their eyes on labor and needed to dispossess peasants in order to get access to wage labor. Um, Marx, of course, that was Marx, you know, um, uh, and and every and we've argued it ever since. So, you know, it's not a new argument, but it it's always it's just so striking as we go through that um, that um, capitalists and those people who are are prepared to pr uh, protect them and promote them, and those people who maybe not, you know. I don't know if we would call every labor, every coffee plantation owner in Guatemala a capitalist because they were dependent on um, forced labor in a variety of ways. But but everybody that would support them saw labor as the issue, right? In Guatemala in the 19th century, labor was the issue. And part of the reason labor was the issue was because land, there was lots of land. Remember, 90 to 95% of the population of Guatemala dies between 1523 and 1640. Right. Uh, the much high, a much higher percentage of population dies on the Boca Costa and the Pacific Coast than in the highlands. So through the 19th century, land in the Boca Costa and the, and on, and the Pacific lowlands is suddenly available. It's not suddenly available, it's been available through the colonial period. But in the colonial period, there wasn't enough labor to tap it. In the 19th century, you begin to get peasants moving from highland regions to the Boca Costa and the Pacific Coastal region because the land's available, but also because the labor's available. For the first time since the 1520s, there's labor available to do this. 
Um, what would have happened? So one of the things that's in my mind really interesting in Guatemala is what would have happened? And that was what was going on during the Carrera period. I argue that the Carrera period is the golden age of the Guatemalan peasantry. Uh, be, primarily because they have both the combination of free labor by and large, they're not, they're not, their labor's not coerced, um, and land. They were begin, they, and you can see all of this history of peasant communities developing all sorts of different kinds of agricultural exports and other kinds of things going, uh, agriculture production going on in the 19th century. What would have happened had that continued? What would have happened had the liberal revolution not happened and then expropriated not just the land, but their labor right. to prevent all of that from going on, prevent that development from happening. The Guatemalan revolution happens at a particular moment that is the 44-54 period, happens at a particular moment in Guatemala. And it's a moment where I think the constraint now becomes not you don't have not enough labor and lots of land anymore. What you're getting is that transition period between not enough land and having lots of labor. And so, yeah. um, and the revolution, I think, is that turning point. Um, so, you know, the popula the Mayan population in Guatemala uh, uh, almost reached its, its pre 1523 numbers by the end of the revolution, almost. Yeah. Um, and so I think from the Guatemalan revolutionary period on then, the constraint is land. There's lots of labor. High uh, plantation owners don't necessarily need to engage in coerced labor after 1954 because hunger coerces them. Right. And hunger coerces them because the population shift has changed, and now the scarce factor of production is land, not labor. But up until that moment in 52 to 54, the scarce factor of production was labor and not land. Right. Um, and so I think there's a shift that happens, and it happens right around the revolution. Um, that doesn't answer your question, um, but I think that it, that's part of the, but remember the first, um, the second article in the agrarian reform law uh, frees all unpaid labor. Right. It's not land, it's agrarian reform law, but the second article says uh, there will no longer be any servidumbre. Right. And all of those people who provided unpaid labor will be compensated. Um, and, you know, so the, there was an understanding that the two mixed together. Yeah. Um, and so are you... I, think, I think you're right. Uh, most, much of the literature and certainly uh, much of the, uh, the peasant leagues and all of these other people put their focus on that. Yeah. Uh, in the agrarian reform. So do you think that, just to follow up, I'm sorry, Mark, um, do you think to follow up then that that was the more, that was the bigger issue here uh, for those who felt so utterly threatened by this, by this reform was that not only is the realistic land issue being addressed, um, but that this labor issue uh, is, is now, you know, Again, if, if we follow your argument that it's always been about that labor, which, I, you know, I'm not disagreeing with at all, is um, could that have been the bigger of the issues ultimately, but they just couched it in, you know, sort of communist, communist rhetoric to, within the context of the, the merging Cold War was really, uh, you know, helpful. Yeah. Yeah. I I don't know that I would be prepared, to, you know, I spent my life writing about land and about the agrarian reform and the importance of land. And, um, so I'm not prepared to say that the big struggle during the agrarian reform was freeing labor. Um, but I do think there is an interesting uh, 
unexamined conflict that was going on mm -hmm. in Guatemala and the highlands around labor that doesn't, doesn't get examined mm -hmm. in the literature. And it doesn't get examined because, you know, David McCreary didn't write rural Guatemala and write about labor so much as he wrote about land, although he writes about labor. And then Jim Handy doesn't write about the Guatemalan agrarian reform and labor, he writes about the Guatemalan agrarian reform and land, you know, so, so I think, you know, part of it is we just haven't examined it, but I'm not prepared because we haven't examined it. I'm not prepared to say that in the 44, 54 period, the struggle wasn't primarily about land. Mm -hmm. I can say before that period, the struggle was primarily about paper. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you. Sorry to hog up time. That's fine. That's good. Um, we still have a brief question um, from, I think it's Mark. And yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, uh, hi, yeah. Hi, hi, Mark. We haven't met. So. Okay. Hi. Nice. Hi. To, uh, nice. For, uh, thank you very much for your uh, talk. Uh, very interesting. And uh, I find it very convincing. Uh, just a, a, a brief question. I know that's possible, but um, I was wondering about the sort of traditional Maya hierarchy that existed in the pre-colonial era and so how that carried over into the colonial era, into the peasantry, and what was the role of sort of the traditional Maya elites in this system? Like, did they collaborate with the Spanish more or were they you know, trying to protect the Maya peasants in this in this uh, system that you describe, how would they how would they fit in, uh, or did they, uh, or were they part of the Maya peasant masses? Um, so uh, it, it, it's it's nice to have a brief question. I can't give a brief answer uh to that sorry um because that's really complex and it gets partly back to uh patricia's question uh patty's question a little bit as well so and the answer to that is that mayan elites did looked after their own interests and sometimes their interests uh led them to protect the maya peasantry and sometimes their interests led them to side with the Spanish and then the Guatemalan elite uh, in exploiting Mayan labor. Um, uh, um, um, so, so two points that I would make about that. Um, somebody that Jorge and Patty and many of us know very well, Julie Gibbons, uh, wrote a wonderful description book, which is about uh, the conflict between catchy Mayan elites and German coffee planters in the Coban region of Guatemala. And one of her arguments is that the catchy Mayan elites were involved in um, uh, developing coffee plantations at the same time as the German coffee planters were developing coffee plantations. But the catchy Mayan elites, because they couldn't rely as, let me go back a step, the catchy Mayan elites were trying to use traditional ways of organizing and capturing my uh, catchy Mayan labor to, to grow coffee. And the German coffee planters were using this state's state imposed um, um, uh, uh, labor recruitment plans. The catchy Mayan elites, I'm doing all sorts of disservice to Julie's argument here, but the catchy Mayan elites argued that the way forward for Guatemala was to free Guatemalan Maya laborers from the constraints of forced labor. But they did this partly because that would allow them more easily to use their own traditional means of organizing and disciplining labor to grow coffee, right? So they, they did that. Uh, Greg Grandin has a book called The Blood of Guatemala about the key Mayan elites in Quetzaltenango, the second, Sheila, the second largest city in Guatemala for most of this period. And he argues that one of the conflicts there was 
that the Quiche elite in Shela had uh, their own traditional ways of commanding labor based on their traditional position in uh, Quiche society. And that that led them inevitably, he doesn't say inevitably, but I'll say it, uh, into a conflict with, with the non-Maya coffee producers. Uh, because, and it was a conflict over labor. Not a conflict over land, a conflict over labor, and who gets to control labor. Um, and I think we can find that in all the other communities in Guatemala throughout much of this period. You find the, 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 the Mayan elites have a, one of the reason they're an elite is because they have access to labor um, through various kinds of traditional Sometimes that means control over land, which gives them access to labor, but it's the labor that's important, right? Um, so you find some places like the um, uh, Ixio elites in Nepal uh, who become labor contractors under coffee in the 19th century. And they use their traditional means of organizing labor to contract out workers for coffee thinkers for other places and pocket the money. Um, so there's all of this, this kind of press, but sometimes that same desire to control their traditional access to labor leads them to support Mayan peasants and protect Mayan peasants against the depredations of the state and, and the coarse labor of the state. Um, does that, does that help? It yes, makes it more yes, complex, yes. but it's... Oh, no, this is uh, very interesting. No, thanks. That's uh, very helpful. Before, before conquest, uh, control over labor was really, really complex. And uh, as we can imagine, as it is in all societies, and it depended on whether you were Kachika, Zutsu, Hill, Kiche, Mam, Pokemon, uh, Kachi, or any of the other Mayan groups, but in the Kiche, which we know best, uh, we know that they had slavery and, and all sorts of other kinds of uh, controls over labor that uh, allowed the Kiche elite to maintain their elite position and to heightened their elite position, it seems, just before the conquest. And, and that, just, uh, just to follow up on that briefly, uh, I think it's very interesting what you're describing when you consider also how the, the Spanish colonial state, right, uh, refashioned uh, the, the role of these indigenous elites as a kind of gatekeepers uh, for tribute and labor between the Spanish state and the communities. And it was this kind of unstable situation where they have to provide labor and tribute to the Spanish, but at the same time, they have to keep their ritual, their position, protecting their community. So, and we have seen that in the work, you know, by Steve Stern, uh, by Sinclair Thompson, there you know, on, on, on the Andean Highlands, or the work on the Bajio, by Tutin, all that in different areas, different uh, realities. So it's, it's a, how colonial relations uh, kind of, uh, mixed with these traditional roles. So that, that's fascinating, absolutely. Is there, do we have any other question uh, about this? Not really. Okay, uh, let me wrap it up then. Uh, it's four o'clock, so we're very punctual here. So the, we don't want to, to keep you here, Jim, forever. So uh, I just want to say thank you very much uh, for the presentation. It was really insightful, plenty of questions. I could stay here and ask more questions. <laughs> I have a whole thing. Now I have to read the book, of course. But thank you very much for, for being with us today. It, was, it has been a pleasure. And hopefully we'll see you soon around here when, when we can. <laughs> And we can actually see each other. Yes. Well, thank you. This was this was great fun, and thank you for all of your for your attention and your uh, interesting questions. Thanks. Okay. No, thank you. Okay, uh, and just uh, we'll keep you posted, all of you, and, and the people for attending, and Jim also including you about the the next events we're going to have. We have a couple of presentations on agrarian extractivism, actually, uh, by Ben McKay, and then Natalia and Claudio Ojeda. So we have other things coming on. So we, we'll keep you posted, also, just in case you have time. <laughs> okay. Good. Okay. Bye.